The readings we just heard were from uh, the book of Isaiah, different aspects, chapter 7, chapter 9, 53, different aspects there. And what, actually, one of my favorite parts about this season of the year um, is that uh, random people um, will be singing the words of Isaiah, whether they know it or not. Right? So you go to your local coffee shop, and the barista who's standing behind there, without thinking about it, maybe singing a song that's on the radio, and they're singing the words of Isaiah. Uh, they are talking about this Emmanuel that, um, who will have this name that will come and be wonderful counselor and mighty God. Or you're at, in, standing in line somewhere buying something, and the person in front of you just hears a tune, and they know the song for whatever reason, and then they start singing about Israel's strength and consolation um, that's there. And you should tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, can you tell me what Michael Buble means when he sings that song right there? Or as Justin Bieber unwraps whatever little town of Bethlehem, what does that mean? You know, you should just interrupt them and ask them what's there because it would be really entertaining to hear. Um, but we're going to look at Isaiah. Um, that is oftentimes uh, one of the, the prophets uh, that gets a lot of attention this time of year. And... Um, the New Testament refers to Isaiah quite a bit, specifically when it comes to the birth of Jesus. And so I'm going to spend most of the time looking at Isaiah chapter 9 um, this morning and some of the scriptures that were just, uh, just read for us. So as we do that, um, as we turn that direction, Isaiah is going to be coming in and as a prophet, he is going to be bringing an oracle or a word to the king and to the leadership. And so there's two things that are happening here. Sometimes there's interpretive issues that come down when it's Isaiah. So I just want to set the framework a little bit. There's a historical context that you need to know about. It's happening in the immediate. And there's also a prophetic context. It's why that the New Testament writers, 700 years later, are going to be quoting him that's there. So first, historically, um, Isaiah is a uh, prophet who is speaking to the leadership. Um, and it's really the kind of upper class leadership and the governmental le leadership of the southern kingdom of Israel. And so... David's grandchildren split the kingdom in half. There was a war, and they couldn't figure out who's going to lead. So there ended up being a northern part and a southern part. And the southern part, they referred to as Judah. That's where Isaiah is sent to be um, the prophet. And during the time that he's writing some of these oracles, as he's doing that, there's three different kings that are there. One of them does really well at first, and then it moves into the current person for Isaiah 7 and 9, uh, a guy named Ahaz. And Ahaz can't really keep the kingdom together. Things are not going well that's there. The northern kingdom comes down, and, and along with another, another country, they come and make a huge dent inside of the political force. They, they take out 120,000 soldiers. There's 200,000 members of the community that are taken in captivity. So that's not going well under Ahaz's leadership. And at the same time, on the other side of the world, Assyria is starting to sort of amass uh, massive amounts of land, and they are setting up their uh, structure and their government inside of these countries. And so King Ahaz has to make a decision. Again, King Ahaz of Judah, um, God's king uh, for his people at this time, has to make a decision whether he's going to listen to what the prophet is saying, where you should be trusting in, in Yahweh. You should be trusting in our God, doing things like David did, according to justice and righteousness, live and rule this way. Or are you going to look to this other army over here? Because Assyria will give you security. Assyria is so strong, they'll come in and they'll set up shop as long as you do all the taxes they want, as long as you kind of let their Baal worship happen in your temple, as long as you do the things they want, you'll get security and protection from this other country that's outside. So Ahaz is forced into the middle of this decision, and that is where, right in the middle of that, is where uh, this uh, context and this prophetic word in Isaiah 9 says that, for unto us a child is born. That's where Isaiah is bringing in uh, that context this morning. And most likely, this phrase, these seven or eight verses here, are a royal birth announcement. So some people actually think it's a hymn, the way that it's structured. Some people actually thought it was the coronation of a new king. Uh, but I think the best reading of it, and, and a lot of scholars lean towards saying that it's really going to be a royal birth announcement. And the reason you know it's a royal birth announcement, they would say, is there's four aspects to most announcements that act this way in ancient Eastern times. One, there's a difficult situation. Check. There's a birth announcement, check. They give the name of the person, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So there's a name associated. Chapter 7, he's just called Emmanuel, this child who would be born. And then lastly, there's an explanation of what it is the child is going to do, the role that the child will play inside of the country. And so each one of those is there. And so you have this royal birth announcement that Isaiah is presenting to Ahaz that's there to tell him that something else is coming. There is a hope. Uh, there is a new ruler that is going to be happening. And in some sense, it's an indictment of how it is Ahaz is leading uh, that's there. So this prof that's the historical context. The prophetic side of this, 
that we would say now, okay, so how 700 years later did the New Testament authors, did they start saying, oh, this, whatever he was talking about there, that actually relates to Jesus, what, what's happening there. So one of the ways to think about, uh, for Christians that have thought about this, one of the ways they talk about uh, the Old Testament being fulfilled is this. So one author says, he says that the Old Testament is a book filled with unfulfilled promises, unexplained ceremonies, and unsatisfied longings. So you have all three of those that are unfulfilled promises. You have ceremonies like the one we're about to do right now that don't have the full explanation. There's an explanation, but maybe there's more meaning there. And then finally, there's longings inside of all the Old Testament writers that you see that aren't fully satisfied. And the question is, is there something that's coming? Is there someone that's coming to do that? So that's what Isaiah is writing about. He's actually writing so that you'll see that the life of Jesus fulfills the promises, uh, that the death of Jesus makes sense of the ceremonies, and that the resurrection of Jesus satisfies the deepest longings of our hearts. That's the way that he's going. So, and we find this inside of a, of a scroll, these prophetic scrolls, that Isaiah, right, after he's, we know at least he has two sons because they're mentioned in Isaiah chapter 8. So he's wrestling with his boys in one room. He goes back to the scroll. He unwinds it. He's writing some stuff down, some oracles to the king. He comes out. He asks his wife, hey, what do you think Ahaz is going to do when I, uh, when I write this one, you know? And she gives him uh, some feedback on that, and then he runs and picks up a, you know, macchiato at the local Starbucks, and he comes back and he writes some more out that's there. And these scrolls get tucked away for Isaiah for all time, so much so that when Jesus comes in and he's reading this as a boy, he's reading these prophetic young scrolls, he's reading the scroll of Isaiah. One time as he grows up, he steps into the synagogue and he says this. He unrolls the Isaiah scroll and he reads it and he says, today in your hearing, this has actually been fulfilled. What Isaiah was talking about 740 so years ago, today what he was promising has actually finally come true. So Jesus himself begins to step into this, uh, as Mike was talking about, these future promises, these longings and these expectations that Emmanuel would come. And Jesus shows up and says, the fulfillment of those pro prophecies has actually happened. And it is me that is there. So uh, the names that Jesus associates himself with here in Isaiah 9 are this, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and then lastly, Prince of Peace. And I just want us to spend a minute thinking about this Prince of Peace because I think at this time of the year, for this lesson, this just helps make a lot of sense. So this Prince of Peace, uh, obviously, if any ruler leads and they can establish peace inside of their country, inside of their community, that would be the ultimate uh, sense. People can go to sleep at night, turn off the lights, and rest their head. They're not worried about uh, things coming in, someone else coming in to get them. But that was not the case when Isaiah is writing this. Ahaz, the way he has led the country, is that people are afraid. They're worried about this. So much so that the verses that we didn't read in Isaiah chapter 9, the ones that my kids have not memorized, um, because you just don't really make your kids memorize these types of verses, are like verse 2, Isaiah 9, verse 2 or verse 5. Verse 9 talks about the people who were walking in darkness. And then they'd see a light. And it says not just walking in darkness, but living in darkness. So much so that they needed to have the dawn break through that was there. Or verse 5. Listen to verse 5. For every trampling boot of battle and every garment that was rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. So this imagery, this kind of warfare imagery of a soldier who's whose boots have blood on them and that there's a fire that's going to wipe out. There's so much devastation around in the midst of this that really, verse 2, characterizes this moment as darkness. Not just walking in darkness, but living in darkness. And it's in that darkness that the promise whew, gets thrust into the world that's there. It's in the middle of that personal tragic darkness that people experience, but also for Israel, for a national sense of, of darkness in which they're longing for peace. They're longing for a ruler that would bring peace. Uh, last year at this time in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article that tried to get at this darkness surrounding Christmas. And the author of this, she's not specifically talking about Isaiah, but she is talking about darkness that surrounds Christmas, and specifically last year, because it was the first year of Christmas in the pandemic, and she was just talking about how people seemed much more melancholy than joyful. She was making a comparison. And to do that, she borrowed a poem from uh, the 19th century, a, a poem that you may know, I Hear the Bells on Christmas Day. Uh, that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote. And I want to read this for you because it gets at the exact same thing Isaiah is doing. It gets at personal tragedy, though, and darkness that's longing for something to come in and bring light. So uh, Longfellow's um, wife 
had died in a fire a couple years before this. And now it's 1863. His son decides to go off to the Civil War and to fight, even though his dad didn't want him to do that. And he gets word around Christmas time that his son has been wounded in the battle. And when a, you know, when a soldier gets wounded at that time, you just don't know what's going to happen. And so that's the context in which he writes this poem about Christmas Day, about hearing these bells. And he says this, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Their old, familiar, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth and goodwill to men. And then for the next five stanzas, it ends in that same phrase. It says, of peace on earth and goodwill to men. But then he turns the corner at the end and he lets, uh, he lets you in on some of the sadness he's experiencing in his own life because he writes this. He says, and in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong, and it mocks the song of peace on earth and goodwill to men. In other words, this promise, and he hears the bell ringing in the background. There may be someone in the other room singing the carol. And he knows that Luke 2 says, the angels say, there's peace on earth, goodwill to men. But he says, in my context, in my moment right now, that's not true. But he doesn't actually finish the poem there. Because there's one more stanza at the end that means, I think somehow he got a glimpse of this hope and this light that Isaiah was talking about. Because he writes this. He says, and then peel the bells one more time. Or sorry, peel the bells loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail and the right prevail with peace on earth and goodwill to men. So how is it that in the midst of war and chaos that he can write this poem that says, I hear the bells, they're actually pointing to this peace that exists, right? How is it that someone who's walking or living in darkness can see the light that's there? Well, in the New Testament, John says that there's one who came into the world who was light himself. And it wasn't John the Baptist who said, I'm not him. I am not the light myself. I am pointing to the light, but I am pointing to the one who has come in, who has actually broken into the world in a moment, a point in time in history, not the promise of an idea, the promise of a person. And that person that the Isaiah was talking about is this person named Jesus. And as Mike just read in the, um, uh, in the scripture readings, Isaiah 53 captures how it is that Jesus brings the peace. And this will take us to the communion table this morning. Isaiah explains that the way that this peace is brought to us, that Jesus can be the Prince of Peace, is that surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, that he was stricken by him, he was afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was laid on him. By his wounds, we are the ones who are healed. Let's pray. God, as we turn our attention to this ceremony that Jesus had made, has made a final sense of uh, by giving his own life so that his body and his blood would be shed for us so that we could receive the forgiveness of sins and that we could know the peace that transcends all understanding that captures every longing inside of our heart and satisfies it. God, we, we thank you for the gift that Christ is and we pray that even now as we participate in this meal that anyone who might be walking in more of a dark season, uh, God, that you would just break through for a moment, give a sense of light, give a sense of your spirit being near us, of seeing us, of recognizing our situations, and of doing something about it uh, through the gift of your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. As we turn to this time of communion, um, you may have these little cups right here in front of you. If you don't have one of these, uh, the ushers in the back can bring you one of these. Communion at Christ Church is for anyone who's a follower of Jesus, so you don't have to be a member of Christ Church. If you're here today and you know uh, Christ and want to join us in this, we invite you to do that. If you're here today and you're just exploring Christianity or a friend invited you and you don't really know a lot about what this is, this is a great time for you as we pause and to reflect on what's central to the Christian faith, to stop and think about what is central um, in your life as well. Uh, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians for us, 1 Corinthians 11, and then I will pray. And after I pray, we will take this together. So you can hold on to this for uh, just a moment. So the words of institution in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. And then he says this, uh, for 
whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until, as Pastor Mike said, he comes again, until we're longing for this second return of our Savior Jesus. Please pray with me and we'll take communion together. Our Father and our God, we uh, come now to this table. We commune with you not as those who are worthy, but are, as those who are unworthy and those who are in need of your mercy and your grace. So we praise you and thank you for that this morning. Uh, God, our hearts are longing for uh, the return of Christ so he would come and make everything right and that we would be found um, as those who are safe, not by our own merit, but by the wounds that uh, Jesus uh, took for us by his brokenness, that we would have life. So we thank you for that. We celebrate that. We pray you would help, uh, even this morning, give us faith uh, towards that end. In Jesus' name, amen.